I always like to start my talks with a, a photo of the audience. Everyone can wave excitedly about what they're about to see. Yay. OK, thank you. Uh, that is all I, all I ask of you, uh, other than listening. Uh, hello, I'm Paul, Paul Tarjan. Uh, I am at Stripe right now for the last three years, working on the Sorbet compiler. Uh, before this, I was at Facebook for five years, worked on HHVM and Hack. And before that, I did my master's at Stanford. Hello, everybody. I'm Dmitry. I'm also working at Stripe now. Before this, together with Martin Andersky, we, we have been working on a project called Dotty. Now it's known that this project will become Scala 3. And we're excited here to present our work in Ruby. Okie doke. Uh, I will start with the intros, uh, and hopefully this will be useful. OK, so we are at Stripe. Uh, has anyone heard of Stripe? Uh, OK, yeah. wow. That's that's phenomenal. I'm so excited. Every time we give a talk, there's more hands, uh, which is wonderful. So we're a platform uh, for payments. We're in 25 countries. Uh, the, the nice statistic we released yesterday, actually, was 84% of people have used Stripe in the US last year. So uh, thank you all for having paid for things on the internet. Uh, and if you're running an internet business, please look us up. And the, uh, the exemplary stripe.com slash jobs, uh, why we're sent out here. <laughs> OK, I, we both work on developer productivity. This is our pillar inside uh, the company. And it is a large, uh, dedicated team that does a lot of different stuff. Uh, we do testing and code, hosting and reviews, developer environments, all the abstractions that people build on, the tools. Uh, we are basically responsible if you're having a bad time at Stripe. Uh, it is our fault. So we're entirely there to try to make everyone's life a little bit better. Specifically, we're on the Ruby side of Stripe, so I want to talk about our Ruby usage at the company. So it is our primary programming language. Uh, we did avoid getting on the Rails train, so there is a little bit less magic in our Ruby than, than normal people feel. Uh, we have a very enforced subset of Ruby. We do love lint rules. Lint rules are one of my favorite things in life, so there is a lot of them. Uh, our product code is in a monorepo. This is intentional. We are going the monorepo route. We're not. Uh, Splitting that out, about 10 macro services uh, and a few satellite services around the edges. But we try to agglomerate a lot more. You know, points of leverage are a nice thing to have. Uh, and most of our code goes into an existing service. We're not trying to, to get on the trendy microservice train. Uh, we are trying to uh, keep, keep this stuff together. Here's our scale of the company, just to give you an idea of what we were working with before we started the, the type checker, the Sorbet type checker. So we have millions of lines of code, uh, hundreds of engineers, and they're producing thousands of commits per day. Okay, so this is kind of a like, medium-sized, good development org uh, that we had to start with and hopefully make it better. We did not invent type checking, of course. We were standing on the shoulders of lots of giants. So Jeff Foster at the University of Maryland has been doing type checking in Ruby for like 10 years now. Uh, DRuby was their first, PRuby, <laughs> Ruby Dust. Uh, all of these are basically the same thing, uh, just different evolutions. And we took a lot of inspiration and a lot of work from Jeff, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, GitHub started an unreleased project uh, that they were also doing type checking since they're using a lot of Ruby. Um, and we, we collaborated with them uh, using the parser. We, we use a share parser between the two of us, which is very nice for them to let us use that. Um, so definitely didn't go this alone. We're very happy that other people have been contributing to the Ruby type checking world. Question we're always getting now, uh, are we open source? We are not, unfortunately, yet. Uh, we we want to first prove it out internally. We want to prove that our code base can scale and can ship a gradual type system on top of a, such a dynamic language as Ruby uh, internally, and then we're going to give it out to the community. So uh, we, we are trying to push on this. We are launching it and using it internally. I'll show you stats on it after that. But it will be coming soon to you. Uh, if you are a large company that is using Ruby yourselves, uh, please send us an email. We are happy to collaborate early on in the development. Um, we would love to chat about that. But I do not like, uh, ooh, I have jumped very quickly. I do not like vaporware announcements, of course. Uh, so there is a uh, online demo. If you go to sorbet.run in any, any of your devices of choice, you can see our type checker in action. So we took our type checker, compiled it to WebAssembly, uh, and 
Or is it running in your browser? <laughs> so type some Ruby code in there and see what it does and see if you like the type system. OK, I'm going to talk about the development, uh, how we built this type, type checker. Right? So we, we assume everyone in the audience is a, a, a PhD in type theory. So the interesting parts to you are going to be the practical parts of how we deployed this and how we implemented it at, at the company. So we're going to dive through some of that as, as part of our talk. So we sent a big kickoff email at the beginning. Uh, this is only full text here for people that are going to look at it and pause the video later. Um, but uh, I want to emphasize a few things. So we send out an email to the whole company that says, uh, we are going to eliminate whole classes of errors. Right? A type checker's job is just to find all method, method, method missing errors and just get rid of them. Uh, we, we have noticed that this is successful in other languages. Right? Uh, MyPy in Python has, has added this on. Uh, Hack on PHP has added this on. TypeScript and uh, Flow have added it to JavaScript. Right? This has been done before. We aren't, we aren't blazing trails. So hopefully that de-risks it a little bit. Um, this makes us much easier to keep our code a living, breathing entity. We believe very strongly that, that code shouldn't atrophy and shouldn't rot. Uh, you should be able to make holistic code changes and migrate your APIs and push everything forward. And without a type system, it's, it's a little dangerous uh, to touch every line of code uh, at the company. So we, we want to be a lot more confident in our code mods as we're pushing these through. Uh, we think that if you write down your types, you think a little more carefully about your interfaces. Right? So instead of just like, I have a function that takes three parameters, and the third one's optional, and it might be a hash. But if the second one's a string, the third one is now an integer. Uh, might not be the interface that you were trying to expose. So hopefully uh, you think about that a little bit before. Um, and also, it makes code more readable. Right? If you can see your interfaces and know what you're doing, uh, you, can, you can do that. So we emphasize this strongly to the company. Got a lot of smiles and nods as we sent out the email. So we plowed forward with the project. Here was our timeline. So uh, just 50 weeks ago, we sent out that email. Uh, and then we dove off into two separate teams. Uh, one, uh, th there was three people on the project that we were pushing, uh, Dimitri, myself, and Nelson, uh, who isn't present right now. He's on vacation, so we'll allow it. Uh, so I took trying RDL at the company, seeing if we can use RDL as our type system. We don't have to build something. That would be fabulous. You know, use something else that already exists. Um, and then Dimitri Nelson took off uh, on the prototypes, uh, see if like, this is a viable solution, if building a type checker in C++ will actually work for Ruby. Um, we gave ourselves a month to see what happens, and we decided, yes, the C++ is going to work. We are going to be able to build a type checker uh, easily, well, maybe not easily, but like usefully in C++, and uh, we're going to dive down on it. So, Oh, wow, this clicker double clicks quite often. So I'm going to dive into the type syntax uh, portion where we were debating and deciding about syntax and maybe give you some insights uh, if you're going to follow similar projects. So we built a runtime type system before this. It was great. It was similar to like contracts where you like de de define a contract above the method um, and the then the method has to abide by that contract. So it was all written in Ruby. People were able to see it and see what it does. There's no magic. Well, it's sort of magical, but it was all at least in Ruby. Um, and 5,000 signatures were made by, made by users while during this period. Oh, man. I am a disaster with this clicker. OK. We did have one learning, though. Syntax changes are OK. So we originally designed the very first one there. You'll see this was our, our way of defining type signatures. We wrote standard method, and it takes two parameters, two hashes. The first hash is a, uh, has the keys as the names of the parameters and the types as their values. And then the second hash has a bag of whatever. Uh, specifically, this is the return types. So this was our first incantation. Uh, it, was, it was interesting and useful. We started with it. But because we're in a monorepo, we just just up and decided, all right, a builder syntax will be much easier for people to use. Uh, we designed it and just did a big code mod and changed all of the signatures into the builder syntax. It's nice to be, uh, to be in a monorepo. So we switched to that. And then we started noticing that there's a lot of problems with uh, you know, pre-declaring things. Integer and string have to have both been loaded at the time of the, the type signatures definition. 
Um, so we just recently moved to a, a, a lazy loading signature, right? So you pass it a, a proc or a lambda um, instead, so you don't have to actually preload all your classes. So we've gone through lots of evolutions of our syntax. I think I, think I only highlighted three of the seven we actually did. Um, but I do suggest, like, don't bike shed like crazy on your syntax. Get something out there and make it flexible enough that you can change it going forward. Here are some of our rejected syntaxes, which I like, uh, sy syntheses, which I like to throw up. Uh, some of my favorites were monkey patching uh, an or operator onto integer uh, so that you can make some, some union types between integer and string. Uh, we debated having this like callable T thing that you wrap types in. Um, some of this was a little off the way. The bottom one completely breaks Ruby syntax. That, that would have been, uh, we'd have to write a, our own parsers and break all the tool chain and everything, all, all the awfulness that comes with that. So we debated all of these and shied away from them, but just wanted to show you some examples of things we thought of. OK, now we're going to move on to the type system portion of our timeline, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dimitri. Yep. Hello, everybody. So when we went on designing the type systems, we started with principles. What do we want our type system to be? And I'll drive you through all of them. The first one is uh, <laughs> we wanted it to be explicit. We, be we, want we believe that there is a space for writing type annotations, and we believe there are areas where they are valuable. If you're, discussing your your, your, if you're describing your interface, there is a lot of value in writing down your intention so that people can read it. In a big repo like ours, with a lot of developers, they spend a lot of time reading existing code and integrating with exi existing APIs. We optimize a lot for readability. The second one was we wanted it to feel useful instead of feeling burdensome. This means that while we want you to write the type signatures when they're useful, sometimes they're not. For example, if you're inside the method itself, we can do type inference for you very easily. And it's your internal interface, it's your internal API. You don't expose it to anybody, so no need to, to do a lot of typing there. That said, if you do want to extract types, you can do this. In the second example here with t.let, you can specify that don't do type inference here. I want it to have a string specifically. Uh, yep. Uh, the next one is we want it to have a simple type system. Simple, but still able to model the Ruby that we're modeling. We started with a nominal gradual type system, which was a good start, and we quickly added union and intersection types because we needed to model control flow and local type inference so that people can be typing less types when they don't want to. Quite fast, we needed to start modeling the standard library, and modeling the standard library grew generic classes and generic methods. Some of the methods in the standard library have weird signatures, like the method that clones objects. Uh, so we needed self-types. And as said before, we have a static and runtime type, type system that both implemented. Uh, we wanted it to scale in multiple ways. We have big teams, and we want so that the tool can be used while collaborating in the team. We also want it to be easier to use across multiple dozens of teams who read code of each other, who use different abstractions between each other. So we emphasize a lot of our readability. And our code base is big and only getting bigger. So it's very important for the tool to be fast and to encourage keeping the complexity isolated behind your interfaces. And at the same time, because we have a limited amount of engineering life, we wanted the development to be up to a point, not postponing hard decisions, so that we can ship fast. OK. Uh, some of the numbers. Performance-wise, we have a huge monorepo. We have a million lines of code. We want the tool to run on every keystroke, which means it has to be fast. So currently, it's around 100 k lines per second per CPU core, and it scales more or less linearly up to 64 cores. We didn't try after 64 cores. <laughs> uh, just for comparison, this is how it compares with some of the tools in the area. Uh, Java C is a Java compiler. Rubocop is a standard linting tool for Ruby, which we use to enforce a limited subset. The good thing about Rubocop is it can run per file. It's entirely syntactic, while we have to run on the entire code base. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next one, which is very important for us, is compatible with Ruby. We want it to, first of all, uh, be able to share this tool outside of Stripe. And this means it has to be Ruby. 
We can't change the syntax, we can't change the evaluation rules, we can't change the parser, we can't patch the Ruby runtime. At the same time, we already have a lot of internal tools. We have IDEs, we have linters, we have various kinds of refactoring tools. We want them to st still work. And if we were to break syntax, they will start randomly breaking too. And the next one is, given that we're a big company, different teams are doing different stuff at every point. Some of them aren't ready to adopt the type system yet because they're working hard to ship a feature or ship a product. It means that different teams will be adopting at different pace. It also means that some teams may decide to never adopt it because they're always in prototyping state. They're always discovering what's a new thing and they want to be m moving fast and they don't actually know what's the type signature of the thing because they don't yet know what it does in the first place. Uh, so because of this, we have some levels of strictness. First of all, the basic level of strictness, which just makes sure that this is valid Ruby. Like, your file should parse. Uh, the next one is you enable type checking, which means we'll start, given the types that we already have, for example, for standard library, we'll start checking that you use them correctly. For example, if we can infer that you're operating in an array from implementation of your functions, we'll be able to check all the calls in arrays. So you don't call bark on an array. The next one is type strict. Type strict requires you to type your interface so that if somebody is using you, they get, check it, they get to be checked. This is intended to be used but for the internal interfaces which you expose to other developers at Stripe. This is how you teach other developers how to use your API. This is how you make sure that they use it correctly and don't blame you f for the fact that they misused it. And the last one is type strong. This is, you can not only have untyped functions, you cannot also have typed values inside your functions, which more or less means we're not gradual anymore. All the things have to be ascribed types. All the things have to be checked. You're more or less at Java level of safeness here. <laughs> okay, the next one. Uh, why do we have runtype type checking? And can we ever get rid of it? Because the teams can adopt at a different pace, or never, uh, you will always have untyped files. Consider this example. We have a file that de defines a function called foo, which de declares that it takes an integer and returns a void. And you have another file which is not typed and calls it with a string. This is an incorrect call because it's passing a string to a place that expects an integer. The problem here is that if the foo method was to try to protect himself from this by like testing whether it per argument that it got is, an int is not an integer, we'll complain about it because we'll say that your test is always false. You get an integer, why do you test it? So if you were to try to protect yourself from somebody passing you a string, we'll complain that your protection code is that code, which means we have to have run type type system because otherwise there is no way you can protect yourself. Yep. So just to be clear, the type system, the runtime type system is, there in, is intended there to stay for as long as we first see from now. Maybe it will change in the future. For now, we don't see it changing. Now, back to the timeline. When we designed the type system, we started type checking some code manually. We were the first users of our own tool where we choose, chose a specific part of the code base, and we started typing it and seeing how it works. We, got, we enjoyed the process, and we started thinking, what does rollout look like? So what do we mean by rollout? We chose a few metrics, which is uh, getting more people to use our type checker, getting more files to be type checked, and getting more call sites in those files to be type checked. Because given that we're a gradual type system, you can have an obvious typing where it say everything is untyped, everything is unchecked, you're done. Okay. So now we want to do all the things, get more stuff typed. So how did we go in this? Well, we went and typed all the things. Uh, nah, that's not how it works. There are three of us, and there are a million lines of code. People are writing more code per day that we can type check manually. We can't go and sig everything manually. So reality is we need tools. We need tools that will help us multiply our effort. And we've built a few tools for us. I'll present you a few tools that we've built. So the first, for, in order to introduce the first one, I need to talk more about what Ruby does, which is also very similar to what was presented about Dart in the previous talk. In Ruby, you can 
define new methods and runtimes for classes that are not aware of this. This function takes a class and injects a method into it. This specific snippet adds a method called favorite number into an integer, which returns 42. Type checking a language which does this is hard because the basic thing that you want to do with type checking is figure out whether methods exist in the first place so that you can type check them. And we have a huge repo. We have a huge number of amount of code that already does this, and we depend on libraries that do this. So how do we go about this? Well, what we did is we made those definitions from being dynamic to static. We built a tool that loads all the code in Ruby, so that the runtime pr processes it, and then runs via reflection and serializes all the methods that it believes exist in runtime. So with that, we can see all the metaprogramming, everything that was conjured by magic, we see everything. We also load everything by our type checker, and we also serialize it. Then we have those two representations, and we div the two. We see the things which are seen by static type checker, and we see the things which are not seen by static type checker. And we can generate a Ruby file from this, which describes the things that we don't see so that we see everything. We do this both for our internal code, which does metaprogramming, and we do this for our libraries. Uh, our internal code some, has something like 200k lines of metaprogramming generated code from this, and the libraries has around 700k. This allowed us to roll out, roll out the tool before we had to support all metaprogramming. We do aspire to support more of it, but we don't, didn't want to block on complete support. We're supporting more of, more of it over time, but we're also eliminating some of it from as we go, but this allowed us to roll out before this is done, so we don't have to, to chase the tail. The next one is, as you type stuff, you find bugs. Some of the bugs are common. Like, for example, there is a lot of implicit assumptions about what's nullable and what's not, which is implicitly encoded in your logic. Like, you know that if I'm in this branch, it's never nil, but you never tested it. So the most common thing that we have to do when type checking files is insert explicit nil checks. We build a function for this, and we've automated it. Our type checker can insert checks for you. We do this for a lot of classes of bugs, which are very common. We can make implicit checks explicit. We can make common bugs be checked in runtime and modify this in the source. Next, the important thing for us after we did this over our entire code base is to, is to find, okay, what did start type checking? So we also build a tool which tells you in the current code base which, what's already type checkable. If you were to ask this file to be type checked, would it succeed? And after you do this, well, it would be nice to have this file actually have something better than untyped. And in order to do this, we needed to find a way to prioritize. What do we type first? So we built one more tool that finds the methods typing which will enable typing the most stuff. Consider this example, you call foo, then you call bar in it, then you call baz in it. In order to type check calls to bar and baz, you first have to type check foo. This is a precondition because you otherwise don't know the receiver. So we will build a tool that's able to find the most impactful things to type so that we don't need to type everything and we know what are the things we should concentrate our effort on. And while we find what the types, it would be also nice to not type it manually. So we build a tool, tool that also suggests what type signature to write. It's actually still using the old syntax because we're in process of migration. <laughs> uh, so given a method, it guesses the type of your arguments, it guesses the type of your return type. It might be imprecise, in particular because your methods can have bugs, because it didn't check all, for all the con like, corner cases, but it gives you something to start with. Yep. Uh, so building all those tools made it possible for us to roll out. And that's the timeline of rollout. So I'll transfer to Paul to cover it. All right, thanks, thanks Dimitri. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll swap you. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the actual deployment of this. All this was pre-deployment, right? We, had, we built all these tools, we built all these SIGs, we started burning things in, but we didn't have a blocking CI job that like, told people, you must type check uh, before, you, you know, before you pass. Um, 
So the canonical, uh, the canonical answer to this is we have to change the car tires while the car is driving. Right? We cannot pause all product development. Uh, finding this video is amazing, by the way. This is actually, a, a, you, should, you should look this one up. Uh, quite phenomenal. OK, how did, we, how did we actually roll this out? Uh, we had a 60-day dark launch period. So we had a period where we were running the job in CI on every push, but it didn't tell anyone. Right? It, it just told us. So it pinged us in the Slack channel. Uh, it told us you know, what branches were failing, what error messages they were spewing. And then we could coordinate with each other uh, saying, hey, why, I'm taking a look at this right now. I, I see we broke the type checker. I see there's an incorrect SIG that works at runtime, and the static type checker doesn't see it. Um, so we, we were able to coordinate for about two months in this dark format until we felt confident enough that we were be being pinged so seldomly that we were ready to give it out to everyone else. Also, interestingly, uh, master branch failures we treated a lot more prominently than uh, anyone else's branch failures, because they could be doing whatever they want, as we found out. Like, people commit code that doesn't parse and that doesn't like anything, uh, and it alerted us. So uh, master failures, all right, fine. Those ones should probably type check. Uh, branches where we didn't want to get pinged in the middle of the night. When we rolled out, we put this preamble on the top of every type checker failure. Okay, So we, we have a big thing that says, hey, the Ruby type checker found a possible error in your code. Um, if you believe this error is a false positive or confusing, please come to our Slack channel and talk to us. Right? There's, a, there's an avenue to, to get some feedback and get some help. We get, you know, this is used heavily every day. Uh, there is a way to run the type checker locally. Heads up, you could have you saved yourself the two minutes of the CI turnaround if you had just run these commands. And then also, if you really don't want type checking, if you want this thing to go away, here's how to make it go away. Right? So we give people a place to come get help, a way to uh, get, it, get the feedback faster, and a way to get out of type checking if they don't want it. And this preamble has been very successful. We, we see all three of these used every time. It is important to give an escape hatch in both directions. Okay? So if you want uh, static type checking, but you don't want it at runtime, say it's a performance critical method, uh, or like the runtime semantics just don't match, like there's a bug in the runtime and you want to get your code out while we fix the bug in the runtime, you can have a checked false on your, on your builder. Um, similarly, if you just want runtime type checking and this weird sorbet static thing, just tell it to go away, uh, we have an unsafe operator that you can just wrap around your thing and everything from there on the static type checker will let happen. So giving escape hatches in both directions we found very, very useful to our, to our engineers um, and these are used in the code base. As Dimitri said before, we had two major, met met bleh, two major metrics that we were pushing ourselves on. So the amount of typed files and the percent of method calls, which we know the, the, the method definition on. So we went from zero typed files, because we just invented it, uh, to 70% in three months. Right? So there was a, a very strong period where we were able to just get the type into the files and say, hey, these are already type checked. We're good to go. Um, the largest thing we did to get that number up was to group our error messages by type. Right? So we noticed, like, oh my gosh, if, if we added a type signature to this one thing, we would be able to type 1,000 more files. Um, or, ooh, the standard library actually does return nil there. We should go <laughs> fix our standard library definition, and then we'll be able to type this file uh, because it's nillable. Similarly, the percent of method calls that we were trying to increase, uh, we built a bunch of punch lists, as Dimitri was showing, built a bunch of tools to give us what to go and type. Um, we got about 25%. We started at about 25% of the calls were known because we took RDLs, standard library definitions, and ported them to our syntax. So just the standard library is about a quarter of our code. <laughs> so that's, that was super great to start with. And then just you know, working through the top of the list and working our way down has got us to about half of the code, or half of the call sites are, are known to us in, in the static world. So, Again, grouping them by what made the transition from typed knowledge into the untyped world gave us a lot of, a lot of leverage of what to type. Graphs are fun. Uh, I, was, I was putting together this presentation, and my boss walked by and says, that looks like a thumbs up is what our, our graph was. Uh, we actually just broke the metrics for a couple days uh, up at the top where we weren't noticing things as untypable, but uh, that's, 
Uh, we'll remove the thumbs up at some point. So this was basically how our typed rollout went. So we started off with a bunch of people thinking their files were type checked. So they liked putting type true in their files, and they thought it was all working, but like Sorbet wasn't running in CI, so it wasn't checking anything. Uh, so we launched and had to untype a bunch of files that like literally didn't type check. And then we slowly put a bunch of the type checking back into the files. Right? So the orange area there is the things that could have been type checked by our metrics, and then we just slowly burned in the things that could have been type checked. Um, You'll notice there's like still monotonic increasing a little bit, so it's, our users are helping as we're going, which is very, very nice uh, to, to be helped by your users. Similarly, our second metric uh, is, is the amount of call sites that we know are, are type checked, the know the type of, and th this was every vertical bar is basically us hitting through some large API. You know, adding it to our, our internal ORM, or adding typing to some crazy DSL that everybody uses. Um, so that's, that's us jumping ourselves up on the typedness of methods. And then the, the gradual slope of the lines is our users adding types to their, to their stuff as they're going on. Uh, we were, <laughs> similarly, we had broken our metric here as well. You, you can tell we're excellent metric engineers. But uh, we wanted to know how much of this effort is done by us and how much is done by our users. We wanted to make sure our users were actually getting value and not just us like sitting over in the corner being excited about typing uh, and no one else is doing anything with type checking. But it turns out that, that as we were rolling out, our users were adding hundreds and hundreds of type signatures per day uh, to their code. So we were adding, hopefully, value to their world over there um, while we ourselves were typing the core abstractions. So that was the rollout. I want to talk about some practical experience we learned while uh, doing the type checking rollout. Uh, these are some, some interesting bugs that we found in our existing code when we added types. Right? So if you're, a, if, if you're a Python developer, a PHP developer, you, you know that you know, uh, uh, random.rand will return, if it's greater than 0.5, it'll, uh, uh, you can assign a variable. Otherwise, you can assign something else. Whoops. But I clearly can't click anymore. But in Ruby, you write it similarly at the bottom. Most people will like check things for truthiness. Um, the problem is a lot of people assume that the integer 0 is falsy. Um, but in Ruby, the integer 0 is truthy. The only falsy things are false and nil. Those are all the only falsy things. So if you do this if statement here, th this is real code, uh, this we will notice that, oh, that's an, always a truthy check. What are you doing? Why should you have something in your else branch? So we're able to tell you, like, hey, you know, get out of your Python mindset, and uh, truthiness is not how you're supposed to check. So you're supposed to write it the top way. Uh, oftentimes, error checking code, error handling code is untested, right? You're, you're like, you don't write your unit test to, to catch your error statement. You write your happy path unit test, right? Um, but if there's, uh, you think like, oh, this is, a, this is clearly a way that we can you know, rescue our, our correct exception, but that is not the exception you're supposed to be rescuing. Right? It's, it's not parse error, it's parser error. Uh, and if that thing is never thrown from you never give it invalid JSON or something, you never get the catch statement and you never get to run that. So the fact that we know that there is literally nothing in the code base called parse error uh, we can tell you that you're, you're referencing a class that doesn't exist. Let me give you a little helpful suggestion of did you mean. Similarly, uh, maybe you're coding too much Python, as, as our examples always have. And this is maybe how you think you raise an exception in Ruby. Right? It makes sense. You raise a thing, and it takes a constructor argument. But you, like, you can't call classes in Ruby. You have to new them up. Right? So here, it, we, we say that, that you can't just call that method. We think you're calling a method called argument error here. You're not newing up a class. So you, you forgot the dot new right after that. So mild syntax, things like this, we can very much notice in the static world uh, that you didn't have to write runtime behavior for. Uh, the most common thing we found was nil errors. Right? So if a user loads something and then immediately does something with it without checking whether the load failed, in between, that you know, should have been checked. You will get a no method error found on your, on your nil class. 
So we, we notice a lot of these. We tell you what the types are. We say, hey, we thought you wanted to pass this type, but instead uh, it wanted a non-nillable type, and you passed it a nillable type, so you must remove the nil somehow. You must check if it was nil and, and error out, or you must call t.must, or somehow you've got to remove the nilness before you get going. Uh, this, is what it, this is what it looks like in a you know, uh, well-typed nil check, because we have control flow dependence typing. Uh, you're able to, if, if you check the nilness of it and bail out and return like a bottom type from that point, we know that that branch is dead and the other branch is non-nil. So this is, this is what we correct people to. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is probably my favorite bug I, I found in this. Uh, people thought that this syntax is how you can do two when clauses. Right? If you just or the two things together, that's a gr that, this actually is a pretty good syntax. I like this one. Um, but unfortunately, this is not how Ruby works. And they were just oring two random things together and checking it if that's the value that you were doing in your case statement. Um, so uh, I separated those two, and we, we were now checking for refunds and charges. Uh, so when we were launching, these are some of the user feedback that we got internally. We were trying to name the project, and, <laughs> and one of the name suggestions was developer happiness. I was very proud of that name that one of our users gave us. Um, but it seems to be a lot of the folks are getting value from it at Stripe. A lot of the folks are, are seeing it's not burdensome. They, they only add types when they need them and when they want them. And when they add them, they do get commiserate value for what they're putting in. So some user testimonials, hopefully, that, that people are seeing value in our type checking. We are not done with our work. As you saw, we're only 70% of the files and about half of the call sites. So we want to ship all those numbers up and to the right before we head out into the open source world. Um, but at least the, the derivative is good. The directionality that we're finding inside the company is useful. So a big glance back at the timeline. Uh, we started off with the project kickoff, tried other things, saw if they worked, uh, prototyped it in C++, decided if that was feasible or not. Decided, yes, we're going to plow ahead. Invented some syntax, came up with some semantics, uh, coded our code ourselves in our first little like, attempt. Um, we got a sister team involved. We said, hey, uh, developer tools, you are friends. Can you type some of your code? Um, and they did and gave us a lot of great feedback on the, on the, the feedback loop. Uh, we got some external folks from outside our organization. We're like, hey, now we're ready. If anyone wants to be an alpha user, try it out, see, see how it works. Um, got some feedback there. Forced it on everyone in a rollout after some, some dark launching. Uh, then now we're working on impactful type checking, right? Find the most important functions and type check those. Uh, we're building an IDE integration using LSP so that whatever IDE you want to work in, you can get some autocorrect, or you can get some type aheads, or you, know, you get the feedback right in your editor. Beauty of IDEs. Uh, we are guessing the types of things, as Dimitri pointed out. So we are telling you what we think your return type will be. Maybe you might want to burn this SIG in, uh, or what your parameter types are going to be. We are working on demagicking the code base. Right? We showed you those you know, uh, n a million lines of, of Ruby code that the type checker does not see, but the methods exist at runtime. So we want to remove some of the magic from those things so that we can actually see it in, in Sorbet in the type checker. Um, and then we're going to ship the thing open source. And hopefully, the Ruby community can use this, this tool. Uh, to do their stuff. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.